to learn about remote learning from a passionate seeker of knowledge and remote learning expert, which is the only conclusion you can t make about Michelle Pekansky Brock after you read her story on her website. And I'll be posting that link to her about page later. And I was enthralled and uh, I'm looking forward to today's presentation. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Thanks everyone for being here. I recognize that um, your time is precious as always, but even more precious. And so it means a lot that you've chosen to spend this time with us. Um, before I start screen sharing in just a second, I just wanted to um, tell you a little bit about myself and let you know where today's um, presentation is coming from. Uh, I started teaching in 1999 in the California Community College system part-time and full-time in 2002. I taught full-time uh, for seven years. I was an art history instructor at Sierra College. Since then, um, since 2009, over the past 10 years, my uh, professional identity has really morphed and um, I've stepped more into a faculty support role. And all of this change really was brought about because of the um, really the, the passion that I felt for online teaching and uh, the amazing connections I was having with my students in my online classes. And I really wanted to explore that. I really wanted to work on that and help others try to understand that, you know, just because you're not in the same place with a human doesn't mean that you can't have meaningful interactions with that person. And um, over the past 10 plus years, uh, this concept of humanizing has emerged. It's not my work alone, it's the work of many people. And I have a slide where I'll reference several of those people, not everyone, because there's just too many. But um, so I wanna acknowledge that. And then the other thing I wanna acknowledge is that this is very much a conversation about equity. And so it's important for me to um, come into this conversation and, and be very clear that I am coming into it from a place of privilege. I recognize my privileges. Um, I strive to be critical of the, of the affordances of my privileges that they bring to me every day. The color of my skin, um, you know, what a racial identity means as a white person working in a diverse system like ours. Uh, my physical abilities, my middle age, my um, cisgender, my sexual orientation, all the different things that, that afford me privileges. So I think it's important to start there. Um, I'm very much a learner and I hope that everyone who knows me will agree with that. Um, I make mistakes. I'm sure I'll make mistakes today and um, we're just, we're all in this together. So I just wanted to have those few things shared before I go over to my screen sharing, uh, which I'm gonna do now. And I'm also gonna put a link in the chat to my slides. These are Google Slides. You're welcome to open them on your own screen if you would like right now. Um, you know, some people really prefer that, that it really helps to, um, it really helps to um, have something to click through if you learn that way. If you wanna wait till later, that's fine. But there are some links on the slides that I do hope that you'll find helpful. So um, I designed them to be a resource for you. i close a couple of things. Denise, you can see I was reading a, a tweet from you up here. <laughs> close that out. Close that out. Um, these are the folks I just wanted to thank. Many of the, the people, all of the people on the screen, in addition to other people, have really shaped the ideas in this presentation. Um, the, the concept of humanizing is a, it's grassroots. It has emerged from online teaching practice. I think that's very important to say. It overlaps with a great deal of research from face-to-face -face teaching. And now we're starting to see it emerge in online research about online teaching and learning, which particularly when we're talking about community colleges is a very emerging space. And um, I just wanna say that when we start looking at research and thinking about research, it's really critical that we look at who the participants in research studies are because community college students are unique. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that we have, I work with, I didn't even say this, uh, currently 
I work with the California Virtual Campus Online Education Initiative, which is a statewide initiative in uh, the California Community College system. And right now we are very much committed to providing resources um, in this time of disruption. So if you go to cvc.edu slash resources after the presentation, I'm gonna have this slide at the end too, but I just wanted to start with it. Uh, we have many, many resources, including a list of events. And those events include things like faculty support drop-in hours where you can join in Zoom and meet with one of CVC OEI's amazing instructional designers and ask them questions about what you're trying to do in your course and get that type of support as well as webinars about how to use different features of Canvas and Zoom. Um, so really helpful resources there. And we're gonna get started by doing a quick poll. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this. This, when I, when I click launch in just a second, this should open on your screen somewhere. I just clicked launch. It should be a separate window that opens on your screen. Let me give you a little tip if my screen sharing has taken over your whole screen and you don't see the window, the, the poll, you might want to just try double clicking on your screen and that'll kind of condense the, the full screen and you might find the poll window. But um, the poll should be on your screen now. And if you could please answer these questions. There are three questions in the poll. I'm not seeing any answers come through. Did that go through everyone? On my uh, control, I, I could still launch the poll. If, uh, it doesn't look like it's been launched. Okay, well, it, it, it launched on my side and only one person has voted. I'm gonna end it. And um, actually, why don't one of you try it? Um, I think, Nicole, why don't you try it just because you're in a host role? Sure. Whoops. Okay, it's launched. Let us know if you're seeing it. Okay, looks like they are. Thank you. Yeah, numbers are coming in now. That's good. So we'll give you a little bit of time to do this. We can see the numbers going up now. We've got about 25% of attendees who have participated. So we're at about a 50% response right now. Since there's three questions in this poll, it, it takes a little bit longer than usual, but that's okay. So Denise is asking in the chat, oh, sorry, Denise, you sent this to me privately. I need to tell you that I'm infamous for forgetting to see the private message. So, uh, but someone just asked, what poll app is this? This is actually part of Zoom. If you turn this on in your meeting settings and the advanced meeting settings in your Zoom account level, you have the option to, to add polls to meetings. Hmm. Okay, so how about we give about another 10 seconds to wrap up the poll. Five, four, three, two, one. And Nicole, do you wanna end it and then share the results? Did, I can't tell on my side. Did you click share results? I did. Okay, great. 
So you should be seeing the results now, folks. Um, and just to take a look at which educational institution do you teach or work. So we've got uh, about 52% of you and we have uh, 325 people in the room now are from the California Community College system. I do want to acknowledge that this presentation is kind of anchored and designed for our, the CCC or California Community College system, but of course the practices apply to any environment. 27% um, came from other, so probably outside of our, um, it looked like a lot of people outside of California anyway. Uh, we've got 10% of people from K-12. I'm not sure what US means. Does that just mean, <laughs> not sure what that means. Oh, that should say UC. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. UC, gotcha. And then about 2% from the CSU system, which is the Cal State University system. Um, and then number two, which best describes you? This is interesting. So we've got about 34% of you saying, I'm transitioning to remote instruction. I have not taught a fully online course. Um, that is really the audience that I was thinking of putting this together. Um, and then we've got 28% of folks saying I'm transitioning to remote instruction. I have taught a fully online course. Um, so your knowledge and expertise certainly will be a value and I encourage you to share the, um, okay, so I'm seeing that you can't see the results. I, I tried clicking shared results on my end too, so maybe you can see it now. Um, but we do recommend and encourage folks to share your thoughts and ideas in the chat as I go through today's presentation. And um, about 7% said I'm in a teaching role, not transitioning to remote, remote instruction. 20% are in a faculty support role, 11% an administrator. And this last question I saw a lot of, um, I saw a lot of comments about, so I wanna address those in a second, but the third question asked, which of the following have you experienced in the past two weeks? Select as many as a reply as apply. So 59% of you uh, said worrying. This is kind of getting into some of the stressors that, um, that are signs of, some of the symptoms that are signs of stress. Um, and let's see, 41% said irritable or restless. 40% said trouble sleeping or sleeping too much. 38% uh, having a hard time focusing. And 7% said making bad decisions. But I loved this. So many of you mentioned in the chat that you, none of those applied to you. And maybe that's why you're here today. Many of in the, you in the chat said that you love this. So um, I, think you're, I think I'm starting to see some connections to, to some of the ideas that we'll be getting through today. So thank you for acknowledging that. This, this is a stressful time for many of us, obviously not everyone, but for many of us, I know that I have been very stressed. Um, and I have had many of those same symptoms. So I wanna acknowledge that, and I, I don't feel like I'm as on my game today as uh, I perhaps normally would be. So um, just bear with me, and I'll bear with you too. I wanna deconstruct a little bit about um, what we mean by temporary remote teaching and learning. In the California Community College system, we to date have had um, a few different types of modalities. Face-to-face -face teaching and learning, of course, we're all familiar with where the uh, instructor-student contact and student-to-student -student contact occurs all face-to-face. -face. Online teaching and learning, where that contact occurs entirely online. Hybrid or blended teaching and learning, where that contact occurs as a mix between face-to-face -face and online. And now we have temporary re remote teaching and learning. And I really want to stress that it is different from online teaching. It's not the same thing. That's why I have it a different color. That's why I have it a different shape. And it's something that most of us have never done before, at least at the scale. Um, so some of the things that we're trying to do on our team is just create a, a picture of what's happening right now. Visual models can be really helpful. So just to demonstrate a scenario that I'm sure many of you will find very familiar, if you're teaching, a, let's imagine you're teaching a 16 week face-to-face -face course and you learn, you'll, you will be shifting to online instruction due to an emergency in week 11. 
What do you do? You take a step back, you take a deep breath, you assess the situation, you identify what's left in the course, the topics, the assignments, the assessments. We encourage folks to use Canvas in our system. It's our common course management system to use pages, assignments, and quizzes within modules to help organize that material, not just for you, but for your students. So there's some structure to what's ahead so students can see where they're headed. Hold live sessions using Zoom. In our system, it's referred to as Tech Connect Confer Zoom during your regularly scheduled course time as needed to deliver instruction and foster student-to-student -student interaction. But the stuff that we're going to really be focusing in today is supporting the needs of all students. And that's what humanizing addresses. Community colleges, as I'm sure you know, serve the most diverse student population. And diversity includes many different aspects of identity, a few of which are um, shared on the team on the, on the slide here. But of course, it extends beyond that. And I'd like to pause for a second and acknowledge the fact that success rates in online courses are lower than success rates in face-to-face -face courses. Now, in 2017, the success rate for online courses in the California Community College system was 66%. And you see that identified with the horizontal bar on this slide, okay? What you don't see here is that our face-to-face -face success rates were about 70 or 71 percent, so about four to five percent higher. It's a much smaller gap than it has ever been before, and that's largely attributed to the quality efforts that we have been focusing on in California that have largely come about through the implementation of um, the start of CBC OEI about five or six years ago, maybe seven years ago now. But when we disaggregate that success rate by race and ethnicity, here's what we see. On the left side, you'll see that our white and Asian students exceed that statewide success rate for online courses. But towards the right, you'll see that our African American or Black, our American Indian, Alaska Native, Hispanic, and Pacific Islander students all fall below that line. And that's really important to acknowledge. Um, it's not something we want to sweep under the carpet. It's something we want to interrogate. And as we talk about this, we don't want to be thinking about it through a deficit lens, which we tend to do in higher education. And I really hope that if this is a new concept to you, it's something that you, you, you carry with you and be very critical about. Oftentimes we look at this gap, right? This gap that is a problem because our students aren't prepared or because of something that our students are bringing to the table. But what I really wanna encourage you to do is think about it differently. Think about those as opportunity gaps. This is the space where we can improve what we do and make online learning a more equitable experience for everybody. With that in mind, let's dig a little bit deeper into what we know about our students in this system. The 2.1 million students that are served in the California Community College system um, uh, are, like I said, very diverse. And last year, the Hope Center did a survey that led by Sarah Goldrick Rabb that determined that seven out of 10 California Community College students experience food and housing insecurity or, homeless, or homelessness in the past year. Now that's important for everybody teaching any kind of class, but as we pivot to online, we need to recognize that we are now serving these students in our classes. We are now serving these students who did not sign up to take an online class. And when we have students who are now supposed to be learning in their homes because they're self-isolating, we have to acknowledge that not all students have homes. Um, also, home is not a safe place for all students. And in addition to that, if we take a look at 
the student groups that are disproportionately impacted by these basic need threats will start to see also that we have our minoritized uh, racial and ethnic groups, but we also see other types of identities like transgender, bisexual, lesbian, gay students, students who have been in foster care, have served in the military, <clears throat> formerly incarcerated, and have ADHD. And the takeaway here is that identity is intersectional. So it's really not possible for us to just focus on certain students. We need to create an environment that is inclusive and welcoming and supportive for all students. The second concept that I want to get started with is this notion that I still see very entangled. Um, there's still a lot of people who equate equality with equity. And these two things are different. They're not the same thing. We are coming out of a paradigm of equality in higher education where we have really kind of had the mindset, and I'm speaking generally here. I'm sure there's many of you who disagree with me and, and are trying to you know, scream on the other side of the screen saying, no, I've been, I haven't been doing this for a long time. But in general, higher education has been very much invested in a paradigm of equity. We treat all of our students the same to be fair, right? To be equal. We see it in policies. I did it myself as, a, as an instructor. I can remember saying to my students, oh, I'm sorry, I can't give you an extension on that assignment because it wouldn't be fair to everybody else. Everybody has to have the same due date, something that I used to say. But the problem with equality and treating all of our students the same is that it implies that all of our students are the same, and that's not the case. So what equity is, it's about ensuring that all of our students have access to what they need to succeed so that they all have an opportunity to achieve the same objectives. And that's a different, the difference between equality and equity. Now, this conversation of equity comes with a real mindset change for educators. We need to start looking at our own practices and stop blaming our students. And I just absolutely love this quote here, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Um, so I hope that resonates. And how many of you were on the amazing webinar yesterday by Luke Wood and Frank Harris? If you were on that webinar, can you please just put a note in the chat that you attended? I'm just curious. So Martez, I saw you there. Denise, okay, so a lot of people were there. Um, that webinar was phenomenal and they introduced five equity-minded practices for teaching online. And if you're not familiar with the work of, of Luke Wood and Frank Harris, I strongly recommend that you, you look them up. Um, and their principles of be intrusive, be relational, be culturally relevant and affirming, be community focused, be race conscious. These five practices, I believe you will see mirrored in the practices that I'm about to share here, okay? So I was super excited. I was taking notes feverishly yesterday. And um, it is, it has, it was archived. It's being captioned from what I understand. Uh, I'm going to have it added into the cbc.edu resources um, area that I linked, that I shared the link to at the beginning of the course. When I get that archive, I will also tweet it out. So follow me on Twitter um, and follow the hashtag at um, humanize online, which is, I'm sorry, humanize OL, which is in the lower left corner of this um, slide. I'm referencing Twitter a lot in this presentation because it's such a powerful community. And if you aren't on Twitter yet, I hope that you'll take this as an opportunity to join and connect with some of your fellow educators that are working in this space. So as we dive deeper into humanizing, um, it's, it's important to recognize that it's really all about learning. And what we're learning more through neuroscience is that learning is not just about cognition, although cognition is still very much privileged in higher education when it comes to learning. Cognition, the domain of knowledge and understanding. But what we often don't recognize is the role of emotion, this whole non-cognitive component of learning 
And when that is flared up, it causes toxic stress, which prevents a human brain, a human brain from learning. And again, I know that I have recognized this problem many times uh, during the last couple of weeks. And I do hope that, you know, if you've felt a level of stress that you're not generally in tune with and you can recognize how it's impacted your work and some of your behaviors, hold on to that and be sure that you leverage that to think about how this is impacting your students. So here comes the Brene Brown show, everybody. Um, for those of you who are familiar with my work, I, I, I kind of am a huge Brene Brown fangirl. She has incredible research around the topic of vulnerability. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about vulnerability here um, because it's a big part of what's happening right now in our lives as well as in our students' lives. Vulnerability from the research of Brene Brown is defined as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Now, a moment ago when we did that poll, there were several people in the chat who said that, I love this stuff, okay? So that's fascinating to me because you are people who most likely lean into vulnerability and I bet you're creative people too. So what does vulnerability feel like? Um, Brene Brown uses this example of it's, it's like when you move out of the seat in the theater and you move onto the stage. I hope that resonates with you. I'd like to ask you, in general, how do you react when you feel vulnerable? If you can answer that question in the chat, it would be great. How do you react when you feel vulnerable? Okay, so I see brave, I do yoga, insecure, quiet, hesitant, I help others, defensive, withdrawn, humble, embarrassed, with aggression, I become still, mean, um, I withdraw, human, frozen, I'm trying to read as quickly as this goes, <laughs> I laugh, passive, aggressive, overthink, a lot of quiet, and then fight the feeling, defensive, it's fascinating. So Brene Brown has interviewed um, thousands and thousands of people, and she has found that most commonly what we do as humans when we feel ourselves stepping into vulnerability is that we armor up. We put our guards up. We try to prevent ourselves from going into these spaces. And what she also shows, has, has shared with us about vulnerability is that when we give up being new and awkward, which is what vulnerability is, we stop growing. When we stop growing, we stop living. So while this is a super stressful time, I just thought that was very powerful. Um, and by the way, she just released her, her first podcast. And this, is, this quote is taken from her first episode. The podcast is titled Unlocking Us, and the link is on the screen. Vulnerability is also the birthplace of creativity, risk-taking, and innovation. So while we are in this place together, transitioning to hum uh, remote instruction, we're not gonna be perfect, but you may discover something. You may find a new way to do something that you never even expected was possible. And that's my hope for you. And also in this place of vulnerability, our antidote is connection. As human beings, we are wired for connection. And we know that meaningful connections occur online every day, right? So tell me quickly in the chat, how have you connected with others while you've been self-isolating? Zoom happy hours, lots of Zoom happy hours, Skype, Pronto, more phone calls and FaceTime, uh, FaceTime, Teams, more family time. Yeah, so we all know this, right? Uh, this term social distancing is, is, is kind of it's been disturbing for me because as we, especially those of us leading this, this shift to online, we hear this term and it kind of implies that just because you're moving out of a face-to-face -face environment that you're no longer being social. And that's just not accurate. It really should be called physical distancing. 
Um, and there were several articles that came out in the past week or so. This is a quote from um, Jamil Zaki, who is a psychology faculty member at Stanford. Social distancing is vital to slowing the spread of COVID-19, but it also pushes against human beings' fundamental need for connection with one another. So remember that as you go into this shift, your students, just because they're not in front of you, they need connection just as much as you need connection. The principles of humanizing um, are presence, awareness, and empathy. And we're going to take a look at some practices that are interwoven into these three principles. Um, you know, practices kind of can cross over between the three, but I'm trying to get very specific about some things that you can do to bring these principles into your remote instruction. This slide offers you a link to a Google Doc that provides um, a, a guide for humanizing learning and teaching in times of disruption. So I encourage you to check that out. And I would like to thank um, Kim Vincent Layton and Mike Smedshammer for many of the ideas that have went into developing this document. Remember this, folks. Remember that in this environment, there are no experts. Um, I don't know about you, but I've never taught in a time of a global pandemic before. Have you? <laughs> there are no experts. You aren't going to be as fabulous as you usually are, and that's okay. We're in this together. Lean on your peers. I cannot tell you how amazed I have been at the dedication to sharing and helping others that I've seen on Twitter over the past few weeks. It's been phenomenal. And so again, like I said earlier, if you don't use Twitter, I really encourage you to take it up right now. Give it a try. Uh, when you're on Twitter, search for these hashtags to find your communities. Keep teaching, pivot online, humanize OL. Humanize OL is one that is specific to humanizing online teaching and learning. The others are more general uh, for this specific moment in time. Another thing to remember is this quote that Luke Wood said yesterday during his webinar, when you give yourself grace for an expectation, do the same for your students. You should give yourself grace. You're not going to be perfect. And it is important to remember that our students need that same support. Um, this quote from Aloha Sar Sargent, Aloha is one of, the, one of the many amazing educators, many others who are here on this call today, who are one of the facilitators at, at one, which is the hashtag or the, the username referenced in this tweet here, one for training. Um, at one for training is part of CVC OEI and we offer professional development courses for faculty to help them prepare to teach online more effectively. So this, this tweet here, which you've probably read already, but I'll read it anyway. Unrelenting flexibility. This is the most beautiful phrase used by a faculty participant in my one for training course to describe the values required to be an effective online teacher and an effective parent. Super relevant in these teach from home with your kids times. Yes, so not only us, but also our students are now learning from home. Many are watching their kids. Many are trying to work, hoping that they don't lose their job, hoping that they will be able to make rent at the end of the month. And many are also caring for um, high risk populations. So all of that is now with, bundled within the learning environment for our students. Sorry, my mouse does some weird things when I use Google Slides. So one specific tip that I have for you here is to be a learning partner. Write a learning pact and have your students add to it, agree to it in a discussion. I have a sample pact here. A pact is comprised of two different components. It's what your students can expect from you, and it's what you will expect from your students. I recommend drafting some language and having students take a look at it and add to it, discuss it, agree to it in a discussion in Canvas. It's a great way to kick off, a, kick off this new moment in time when you transition to remote instruction. Um, you're free to use and adapt the, the example that I have here on the slide if it's helpful for you. You also don't wanna be a robot. 
And what do I mean by that? About 10 years ago, I was teaching a professional development course and one of the faculty participants in the class said that she had shared some feedback with one of her student, online students and that student wrote back and said, oh my gosh, I always thought my online instructors were computers. When you transition to online, if you aren't intentional about constructing your human presence, your students won't feel it. And that's really, really important. Don't assume just because they've had you in a classroom for part of a semester, that that presence is going to translate into the online environment. Oh, and let me say one more thing about that. 10 years ago, this was kind of laughable. Today, it isn't. Today, in the, the dawn of artificial intelligence, we have computers that are starting to teach courses for students. So this is our space to claim and to be present and to stress and convey and critically interrogate that space and remind everyone that relationships are at the center of every learning experience, regardless of whether they happen in a classroom or online. Research conducted on online community college students in 2016 showed that the only course design element that significantly and positively influences grades is quality, quality, not quantity, quality instructor to student interactions. And if you're wondering what quality means based upon the student, um, the student data that was collected in the, that, that study, it was a sense of caring. It was when online students feel like they have an instructor on the other side of the screen that cares about their learning, that's what designates quality interactions. So keep that in mind. Also from that same study, we found that um, more students did not experience that. It was more likely for them to not experience quality instructor to student interactions. And they also reported the need to teach themselves. So these are opportunities to keep in mind and really build upon. One of the things that really matters is social presence. And social presence is one of the three um, facets of the community of inquiry model by Garrison, which is very popular and used in online teaching. It's defined differently by many scholars. I like this definition here by Guna Bardina, the degree to which a person is perceived as a real person in mediated communication. So remember that as you're communicating and be sure to communicate with your students. What we know from the research is that when social presence goes up in an online class, more students are satisfied at the end of the course. We also see more frequent student to student interactions. If you find yourself trying to foster a discussion and no one's really participating, think about social presence. These two things are directly correlated. And the, and the third thing that increases is, um, is actual and perceived learning. And this is based on research. There's quite a bit of research about social presence um, out there. I'm gonna take a moment to embarrass one of the participants on the call today. This is Daya Mudra Denahi, and I think it's really important for you to see an example of what humanized, um, what a humanized message, I should say communication looks like. I'm gonna click here and go out to Twitter. This is a message for- Can you hear that folks? All right of my students online and face-to-face. -face. This is our last day on campus. Starting next week, all classes will go remote. So for my online classes, things will continue as normal. All of your assignments are due Sunday this week. And face-to-face -face classes, we will have our first remote meeting Monday on Zoom. And I've sent you an announcement about that. I am hosting uh, student visiting hours tomorrow online. So I will have a Zoom room open from 10 to 12. So just pop in if you have any questions about our remote format, if you need help with technology, or if you want me to take a look at your work. So most of all, be kind to yourself, be kind to each other. I'm here to support you. And this is a chance for us just to appreciate everything that we've got and we will make it work. Take care. I love that. 
Now, Daya is on the call here today. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter at SFDaya, and I encourage you to do that. She made that video with Clips for iOS, who I know several other people use on this call. Uh, Fabiola Torres is the one who introduced me to Clips. Denise Maduli Williams is a rock star with Clips, and um, she's another one you should follow on Twitter, and they are both on the call here today. So I hope that they'll jump in if there are any questions in the chat that I cannot answer as I'm speaking. The other thing I want to mention, though, is that, you know, you don't have to use Clips. Uh, Clips is a, a super cool app. It does auto captioning that you can adapt on the fly. It does only work on iOS devices or Apple mobile devices. But if you have two things, just two things you can get going. And I'm just going to show a clip of this video, this tips video that I created this week. Hi there. Do you have a smartphone? Do you have a Google account or are you willing to make one? If so, you have all you need to humanize your students' remote learning experience. Here are a few tips to get you started. Your students want to see you, so avoid standing with a light source behind you. Watch how things change when that light source is in front of your face. Don't try to be perfect. You know why? Because you're human and so are your students. <laughs> Don't hold your phone like this. Hold it like this instead. Don't be afraid to be a little bit more human and show aspects of your non-academic side because it will only make you more relatable to your students. Make eye contact with your students. This is something I have to continually work on. I always have a tendency of looking over here on my phone, but the camera is actually over there. And when you look right at the camera, it makes a difference because you look into the eye. Oops. Okay. Well, you're going to have to watch the end of that on your own. <laughs> my mouse took over. It was almost done, but I'll make you click the link to watch the end of it. Um, yeah, so those videos are not hard to do. They're, they're, and if you have a smartphone and some way to host them, I, I said YouTube because YouTube is free and it's easy to go in and edit the captions. And by the way, I do have a link at the bottom of this slide that uh, shows you how to edit YouTube auto captions for accuracy. Um, also, know your students. You need to know who's on the other side of your screen. And you may think, well, I know my students. They're in my classroom. There's a lot about your students that you don't know, and there's a lot about your students that is changing at this time. There are situations that are changing every single day. So I really encourage you right now, like today, if you haven't done so already, put together a survey. Ask your students these things. How many online courses have you successfully completed? Don't ask how many they've taken. Ask how many they successfully completed. Then you'll have a sense of who kind of has, has their bearings in this space. Let them know that you may leave them voice or video feedback, which implies that you should, and ask them if that works for them. If you have a student who says no, then honor that. Honor that preference for your students. Don't ask why, don't judge them, just honor that. And um, those are some options you can include there. How do you plan to access this course most? Are they gonna be using a computer or laptop or are they gonna be using a phone, some kind of mobile device? Know that going into it. It's really good to have awareness of that about how your students are going to access things. In one word, how are you feeling about our class? This question really is powerful. I, I assure you that you're gonna learn things that you didn't expect in just one word. You're gonna have students who say fine, you're gonna have students who say overwhelmed, or scared. It's going to let you know who needs your human touch right now and you should follow up with them. And if I were you and if you're using Canvas, I would strongly recommend you to leave a video comment in the Canvas gradebook if you're using a Canvas survey. So there are lots of ways to do this, but those are some tips that will really be sure that your, your students know you're there for you and that they feel supported. The other thing is what is one thing that is most likely to interfere with completing this course successfully? All kinds of things come out of this question also. Um, when I've taught fully online courses, again, not this situation, 
I can't tell you the number of times I found students who said, um, I'm pregnant and I'm going to deliver, you know, in whatever week this semester, or I, my, I have parents at home, I have a mom at home on hospice and I'm, I'm taking care of her. So finding out what's happening, finding out what the stories are of your students and leaning into those stories. Again, not judging, just listening to them and letting, letting your students know that you hear them and you see them is the most powerful way you can start off this transition into remote instruction. And then you wanna adapt your teaching. And what I mean by that is if you're using Canvas, go into the grades area and there's an option to enable the notes column. This link on the screen takes you to a Canvas guide that shows you how. Take notes about what you learned from the survey in that notes column. So that way, as you're grading student work and if you're looking at you know, who's logged in and who hasn't turned in what, you can reference those notes and you can see what's going on with the student. Reach out to the student with a message before it's too late. Reach out to that student and in the subject of that message, put their first name. Carlos, is everything okay on, on your side? Is everything okay? That's a phrase that Katie Palacios always stresses. And if you put the student's name in the subject line, when they're scanning messages, they're gonna see it and they're gonna know that you're reaching out directly to them before they even open that email. Of course, track activity and performance. And as I said, reach out directly before it's too late. I know that we always tell students, reach out if you need help, we can't do that. We need to be proactively reaching out to them. Many students, and this is something that Wood and Harris emphasize, um, reaching out for help is perceived as a weakness by many people. That's a construct of masculinity, particularly within uh, Black and African American culture. So remember that and reach out, be proactive. As they say, be intrusive. Create a space for sharing. Uh, this is a screenshot of a discussion called Socially Connecting, something you could create in your Canvas course um, where you give students an opportunity to talk about what's going on on their end. For the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to play this video, um, but this is my sample video from that discussion post so you can see what I say. And it's just a warm invitation to invite students in and share what's happening on their end and encourage students to lean in and support each other, provide each other with support and help. This video here will walk you through the steps to embed a video in a Canvas discussion, embed a YouTube video in a Canvas discussion. So if that concept as I talk about it sounds foreign to you, it may not be foreign to everyone, but if that's new to you, watch this video and it'll walk you through the steps um, and you'll be able to master those skills in no time. It's also important to seek out mobile friendly tools. Seek out mobile friendly tools. Um, you know, Canvas is one of those tools, but there are other ones too. Adobe Spark Video is a video creation tool that's free. Think about giving your students the opportunity to create a video instead of write a paper. Can you expand? Can you get more flexible with the ways that students can demonstrate their knowledge? Adobe Spark Video can be, you can create a video on your phone. It's super easy. Um, so that's something I want you to just kind of let simmer and think about as you, as you plan the rest of your term. Flipgrid is an asynchronous video interaction tool. VoiceThread is asynchronous voice video or text interaction tool. And then Pronto is, is a synchronous uh, interaction tool. And I really encourage you to, if you haven't done this yet, reach out to your college and find out like what tools are available to me. Don't just assume that you just have a license for Canvas. In our California Community College system, we have 18 colleges that have a site license for VoiceThread. And I bet there are lots and lots of faculty on those campuses that don't even know that. So ask. Um, this is a video assignment that was contributed by Janet Mitchell Lambert, um, and we are really running out of time. So unfortunately, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you watch these videos on your own, but it's a wonderful example of how to use Flipgrid um, and have students, you know, you give them a prompt and that you say, on your phone, go find a place. 
that reminds you of this poem that you read today. Now, of course, students are limited with where they can go today, but there's a great student clip here that's shared with permission. There's also a clip of Janet reading her prompt. If you can use phones as an asset in your class, you know, not like this annoying thing that I have to contend with, but design assignments that, that welcome and embrace being mobile, you will really change the paradigm and your students will love it. This is a, a, just an image of what VoiceThread looks like. And if you do click that image, it'll open up to an example of a VoiceThread. Um, this is something that I call a wisdom wall that I've used in my classes for a while. And it's an opportunity for students to step in and uh, demonstrate themselves as experts. You can do this after a test. You can do this at the end of a course, but it's about looking for the positive things, right? What, what do you know now that you wish you had known then? And then you take that and you share it with the next group of students. So students are actually learning from students. And this is a wonderful video of Fabiola Torres, who is on the call here today. And uh, on your own, you can click that video and watch it. And you will actually be taken into Fabiola's home. She will invite you in and she will show you what it looks like to be interacting synchronously with, um, with her <laughs> students on Pronto. And of course, she's, she's got her mobile device there. It looks, looks like it's attached to her dog food container. And so it's, I love seeing these behind the scenes setups are great. They're super helpful. And I'm gonna end with just a quote from Fabi. Um, Fabi, this is from a, an article that was in the in, Inside Higher Education this week. And Fabi said, come April 1, I still get a check. How many of my students won't get a check? That thought keeps me motivated and focused on my duty. I love that quote. And so I want to ask you to keep your mind focused on what motivates you. What motivates you? Reflect on that question. And um, Here's our link to the cvc.edu resources page. If you are a California Community College faculty member, we're offering faculty support hours today at 12 o'clock and four o'clock, an opportunity to drop in and meet with an instructional designer, a webinar on collecting student work with assignments at two o'clock, a webinar on communicating with students with Canvas announcements at three o'clock. So I'm gonna stop screen, sharing my screen. Um, I did go over. <laughs> I hoped we'd have about 15 minutes for Q&A. We have about five. So um, I know a lot of people have to run right at 11. So we would like to take some questions. If you have some qu a question in the chat, please go ahead and, and type it in. And if you put a question mark in front of your question, it actually would be super helpful because we could find them easier. Michelle, I found a couple in the chat yeah. you were presenting. Um, here's one. Um, any thoughts on how to make these ideas work with large numbers of students? I have 375 to 400 students this semester. I think a lot of the ideas that I shared here today work great with any size class. Um, first and foremost, when you are fostering your presence with your students, it's one to many. So those videos that you create, they touch everyone who watches the video. So that doesn't matter how many people are in your class. If you're creating a discussion place for students to connect, you don't need to monitor and assess everything in that, in that space, right? Um, it's really recommended, again, go back to that pact. Think about also, um, so in that pact that I shared, there were some elements of, of what we call netiquette but tease that out a bit more if you, you know, if you feel like you can't have your arms around everything. Um, and you know, let your students know that if, if something does come up in a discussion that they're not comfortable with and maybe you don't catch, they can bring it to your attention confidentially and you will, you will take care of it. Think about it like a community. When you have big classes, the mobile, the kind of hands-on activities, those do get more complicated. Um, and I'm outright, you know, that ratio of teacher to students, the bigger, it, the, big, the what larger that ratio gets, the more students you're, you're, you're teaching, the fewer students you can touch individually. But I do want to say that using the notes column is a really valuable strategy because it helps you to remember that you don't need to be reaching out individually and supporting every student. It's just the ones who indicate to you that they need it. 
So that is a strategy for a larger class, but I acknowledge that big classes are barriers. Was there anything else that came up in the chat? Yeah, I'm trying to gather them. Um, okay, I know it's hard when it moves. So up. this is an interesting one. Is there a tool to learn students' names as and hear them pronounce their names? Yeah, there is a tool. Uh, it's called, well, there's probably more than one tool, but there is a tool um, that some colleges in the community college system use called Name Coach, N-A-M-E Coach. Um, and there, it does come with an integration into Canvas. So I, I, again, I, it's something that has to be integrated at the college level. So that's something to check out. Uh, but there's, there is a free version of Name Coach that I use and I actually have it embedded at the bottom of my email signature so anyone can click on my name and hear me say it. So that's something you can check out. Okay, and here's another one. What do you recommend for new to online learning with adult immigrant English language learners who much prefer the in-class model? So I didn't say this, but Daya Mudra Dennehy and Denise Maduli Williams, they are two fabulous teachers uh, who teach ESL. And Daya was the one, the video that I showed. Um, and so Daya Mudra and Denise, they are the experts you should go to and ask that question. And I don't know if they're still on here or not. Um, but yeah, so Denise just put her Twitter handle, it's at Professor Mad, at Professor Mad Will, is that right? I guess you would know, not me. <laughs> um, Oh, there it is, at D. Maduli Williams. That's the handle I was looking for, Denise. And then Daya is at, at SF Daya. I can't recommend reaching out to them enough because they have dealt with all of these discipline specific challenges and they're the experts in that area, not me. Thanks for all of your feedback in the chat. It's great to see. Um, so Fred is asking, what's the learning curve for Flipgrid and Adobe Spark? How easy are they to learn to use? I think that probably depends, but Fred, I know you, you're a pretty savvy guy. Um, and if you're talking about for students or for faculty, you know, the Flipgrid has a Canvas integration that's free. If you're thinking about using Flipgrid, use the Canvas integration. Because if you don't, if you just use regular Flipgrid, your students are going to need to have some type of account. I think they need to have a Microsoft or a Google account. If you use the Canvas integration, students do not have to share any of their information. They don't have to create an account. It's just a matter of click and they can participate. Um, the other thing I want to stress about Flipgrid, as much as I do love it, it does have auto captions built in, um, but it does also expect students to show themselves on video. And I really want to encourage everyone to be sensitive to that because there are some students who don't want to do that or in this environment aren't in a space where it's appropriate to show themselves on video. So that's just my one thing I would say about um, Flipgrid. Adobe Spark is super easy. You'll, you'll create a video in 30 minutes. It's, you'll love it. <laughs> it's awesome. And the, the accessible workflow for Adobe Spark video, you create the video in Adobe Spark, you download it to your computer. And then what I do is I upload it into YouTube and do the captioning there. So the captions don't work in Spark. So it, it, to be accessible, you need to upload the video somewhere else, add the captions, and then do the embed in Canvas, which is shown in the, the one video that I have on the slides. So we are at 11.02. Um, I hope that we've been able to answer enough questions. This Someone's has been fantastic, Michelle. I, I, I could tell by all the comments that uh, people are thrilled. And I, I, what I enjoy, because very often when we talk about the technology of distance or remote learning, people, people go right into the technology and you, you really uh, establish the human side, the interaction side, the caring side uh, so clearly up front because it's, it is a, it's, it's a difficult balance as we're trying to get used to the physical technology of this stuff to keep the human side in balance. I, thank you so much for sharing that. 
I, I'd love to just open this up for questions for the next hour, but I know everybody's got to move and we will be uh, posting this. I believe Nicole normally gets these uh, things consolidated and ready and, and, and transcripted within the week. And uh, so we'll have this up right away. Any, any final comments? No, I would just like to thank you, Steve, for reaching out and giving me the opportunity to share here today. I, I, I really appreciate being included and a big shout out to, to all of our online educators who are working so hard right now. So, um, and becoming online educators. So continue to grow together. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future. All righty, good. Well, we'll let you go now. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Take care.